started attending the church, met my husband like, pretty soon after I moved to London. Basically, we'd slept together and, you know, in Paul says in Corinthians, you know, it's better for you to marry than to burn with lust. So we're like, okay, you know, we're going to get married, do the Christian thing, got married. And life was brilliant up until a month after we got married. And the police just kicked down our door. They arrested us both. The Profile with Premier Christianity magazine. Hello and welcome to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio with me, Sam Hales. I'm the editor of Premier Christianity magazine. That's the publication that sponsors this show, brings it to you each and every week right here on Premier Christian Radio and also on The Profile podcast. And well, have we got a fascinating story to share with you today. I've been speaking to Jendela Benson. Jendela is the author of the critically acclaimed brand new novel, Hope and Glory. But she's been speaking to me about the moment when her life changed dramatically. Recently back from honeymoon, she discovered the police were kicking down her door. She and her husband were arrested on money laundering charges. And I've been speaking to her about how her faith survived that ordeal. Some of the detail of what took place involved her husband going to prison. It involved the love and support of her church family carrying her through an unimaginably difficult time. And as we spoke, I discovered that her story really had quite a profound effect on her own personal views about God, about what living the Christian life is all about, and even what kind of blessings or deliverance should we expect as Christians. I'm grateful to Jendela for opening up and sharing this story with us here at Premier in full for the very first time. I started our conversation, as we often do here on The Profile, by going back to the beginning and asking Jendela what life was like growing up in Birmingham. Yeah, so um, I was born in Nigeria, but I moved to the UK with my parents when I was very small and I grew up in Birmingham where my brother was born and um, yeah it was just the four of us really Um, most of my family was either in Nigeria or um, I had family in London but um, in Birmingham it was just kind of like me and my dad my mum my brother um, not it was nice it was I mean okay let me think well it it was nice but there were challenges um So I grew up in a kind of like very white working class neighbourhood for part of my life. Only black girl in my class. I went to a, um, on the other end of the spectrum, I went to a very like middle class white secondary school. Again, the only black girl in my class. So I did have kind of like these troubles around, um, I guess, identity, like fitting in, like where do I belong? And then, um, yeah, coming from all different angles. And then there's like this, generational thing like my parents didn't grow up in the UK they grew up kind of um in Nigeria primarily so there was like that lack of perhaps understanding as to what I was experiencing as kind of like a young kid in Britain so um I definitely felt like um I guess all my turmoil was in that so there wasn't necessarily anything necessarily bad that happened to me like outside I'll say I had a very like nice childhood my parents did well but a lot of the turmoil was kind of inner in terms of who am I? Where do I belong? Like, what is going on? Why do I not feel like just comfortable in my skin, essentially? Yeah. I was going to ask you about that kind of dual Nigerian British heritage and how it affected you. Because I think if if you're someone who's not had that experience of of being the only white or the only black person in a room it's probably quite hard to understand or identify yeah. with it. what does that actually feel like and for you that's that's what sounds like the entirety of your school years you're having that experience on a, on a daily basis of like what feeling like the odd one out is that is that the yeah. right language yeah I think it was essentially that just feeling like the odd one out so in primary school all my ki- all my friends were having like pizza and chips for dinner and my mum would be making like rice and ground rice and stew and all this Nigerian food and then there's a kind of like embarrassment you know at that age like you're very young you just want to be like everyone else an embarrassment is kind of like um it, I wouldn't say it was shame at that point because I as much as I felt odd I still like really identified as like Nigerian and I knew that I was my dad's half Nigerian half English so I knew what my heritage was and I wasn't necessarily ashamed of the heritage it was just ashamed of not 
fitting in and kind of like being different and um and I think there comes like other things as well so being like one of the only black families like in the neighborhood when stuff happened and the police got involved because we lived on a road where there was like a police station like right kind of it was a lounge or carriage into the police station like halfway up so when stuff happened it was like the police would always knock on our door and in that age you don't really understand you're just like why are they always like knocking on our door like my they came for my brother like once or twice when he was like really young like oh we've heard that someone's cds are stolen and you know where's your brother and it's like my brother was at Mary Hill with my mom shopping <laughs> like what, what what do you mean and there's all these kind of like little things like now looking back and you can kind of say oh that was like police harassment or that was being profiled but at the time it just felt like this big arrow pointing at you like you 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 do not belong here you're the odd one out you're constantly being sing- singled out and um I think it just it made me just really want to fit in and just or at least try and find an identity that I could wear with pride even if it was kind of like being the other one out I remember going to kind of like secondary school and everyone being quite like middle class and from to my understanding posh backgrounds um and then I just really leaned into the fact that I wasn't that so like I was like you like using all the slack like it was quite funny but just really leaning into the fact okay so you're like that so I'm gonna be all the way this way like I'm gonna try and own my difference um with like wearing it almost like a costume I guess and that kind of carried on for a long I used to get in a lot of trouble at school partly I think it was a lot of angst that would just make me act up in school and that continued until um I was I think I just got to the stage and I was like, I just don't want this any, like, I don't want that I grow. And I was, I've been raised in church, always gone to church from a young age. And um, we'd started going to this new church and it was like a big youth group. And I remember speaking with like the youth pastors and stuff, just about how unhappy I was at school. And they would like pray for me and they'll pray with me and they'll talk to me about it. And I kind of just decided, you know, what? I don't want to be like, I just don't want to feel this way I don't want to feel constantly like I'm performing I don't want to feel just so uncomfortable in my own skin and it was like um I guess it was almost like overnight (laughs) overnight I feel like I changed I was the thing I used to swear a lot like that used to be part of my little costume like just effing and blinding all the time like trying to be hard or whatever and I remember overnight I just stopped swearing like I was 15 and that was like a big thing to me like oh wow like I just don't swear anymore and I uh, I kind of changed I guess and I was like okay like I'm not gonna purposely get in trouble I'm not gonna act up I'm gonna just you know keep my head down do my GCSEs all that kind of thing but um, funnily enough after that happened I actually got suspended like a few weeks later for something that had happened before so that was a bit like huh <laughs> 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 what like I'm trying to do the right thing and now I'm suspended for something that happened um before which was re- it was really dumb I had a little website I was into like websites and I'd written like a blog based about how I hated all my teachers and I'd use their names because I didn't know any better and the school had found it and I got suspended um so it was like yeah it was <laughs> that that was a funny kind of like sequence of events but um after that yeah I just went on to college I left that school I went to a college where it was way more diverse I felt a lot more at home and I really felt like I just flourished like yeah. I was kind of like the Christian girl in college and I was happy I had lots of friends like no qualms and yeah that was kind of life in Birmingham up until I left it sounds like um that was quite a profound moment then in your church and being prayed for. And I suppose a lot of people as teenagers can relate to that, that sort of struggle of identity and wanting to fit in. But it, but it sounds like from that moment when was it a youth leader prayed for you, as you say, kind of overnight change. And, and I know you had a strong, uh, you mentioned Christian upbringing in your family as well. So, so faith has sort of always been a part of part of your life. Yeah, it always has. Um, I remember from a very young age, like going to um, the Kenneth Copeland's like crusades that would happen in Birmingham. I have a very vivid memory of being like four or five and them doing the altar call and being like, yes, like I want Jesus in my life. And 
it, my grandma sadly passed away but she always used to say you know when you were young you'd be sleep you'll be praying in tongues in your sleep and all this kind of, maybe I was just talking in my sleep who knows but she was like like that was the environment that I grew up around like everyone was very kind of like strong in their faith and church was like a very big center point for our lives and I think especially growing up in these environments where um we it felt like our family was the odd one out like we went to churches where there were like other black families or other brown families or just a mix of people or just like even amongst the white people in church it wasn't a thing and I all remember we went to um as a family we went to go visit this very old white couple who were part of our church and we went for lunch and we were sitting there and you know having a good like my parents are talking and and afterwards I remember my dad saying you know this wouldn't happen anywhere else but church like there wouldn't be any other environment where this young black family would go around for lunch which is very like old like they were probably in their 70s or 80s and we'd sit down have lunch and just be talking and kind of chilling as friends and I remember my dad very clearly saying that if this wouldn't happen in any other environment like that is the thing about Christianity and the gospel it brings people together that otherwise probably wouldn't even see each other on the street yeah absolutely so coming back to your story you mentioned um I think you moved from Birmingham you moved down to London next just tell, yeah. tell me what happened next yeah, so I moved down to London for um, I moved down to London for college or university, and again, it was another big change. It was a, it was I always knew I wanted to move to London, but the actual process of moving was very, I think, hard emotionally. Looking back, so yeah, like sixteen to eighteen, I'd found my like niche in kind of like I was very active in youth at church. I had my college friends everything was when I moved to London and I was just really lonely um it was a big kind of change I am actually an introvert which kind of surprises some people but I'm not always very outgoing and especially then at 18 I was not outgoing at all I had a lot of kind of just social anxiety about being in the big situation so I had I knew a few people in London but I think that was when I first kind of properly had kind of depression essentially like being by myself in London not I, and back to that not fitting in so I'm now I'm at art college and I don't fit in there again um I don't have the church community I don't have that kind of like fallback as I did in Birmingham so now I'm like just trying to like find myself and um it took a while to um yeah I guess find a church and to kind of find my stride and um but eventually um yeah got there got to um started attending the church met my husband actually the the first time we my husband like pretty soon after I moved to London and um, we got into a relationship um and then <laughs> and we'd basically we'd slept together and you know in Paul says in Corinthians you know it's better for you to marry than to burn with lust so we're like okay you know we're gonna get married do the Christian thing we're not gonna you know fornicate or whatever we got married and life was brilliant up until a month after we got married <laughs> I'm laughing it's not funny or a month after we got married and the police just kicked down our door and um it was like the wildest thing they came they arrested us both and um it was a real moment like again what like I was so baffled like what is I had no idea what was going on but essentially they'd been investigating my husband's business and there was some stuff going on there that they were obviously thought was criminal. So they came, they arrested us and um, I was in shock again, knowing nothing about what's kind of like happening, but kind of from my upbringing, my like kind of Pentecostal upbringing, I'm like, this is an attack. Like this is, you know, there's going to be a mad testimony that's going to come out <laughs> come out of this. Like my faith was like really kind of like strong and kind of like believing. Long story short, that wasn't the case. We were like, for like almost two years, we were on bail, like back and forth in the police station. Every time I'm thinking, no, like they're going to throw this out. We're going to have this testimony about, oh, you know, they tried to arrest us and God came. And that was like my idea of Christianity. Like, everything's going to work out we're going to be fine it's all going to be fine and it wasn't fine um about yeah how long was it we were up for about two years then 
it, the the thing went to trial and essentially um my husband got convicted for fraud um he got sentenced to seven years and I got convicted on money laundering charges because I'd been accepting money from his bank account in the run up to our wedding and all that kind of thing and I rem- and again it was kind of like going back to the like getting suspended from school situation it's like what like god like we did all the things that you're meant to do you know we were having sex outside of marriage so we got married we did all of the things and this is kind of like the outcome so um that was a massive massive knock to my faith i think um i remember the day that the sentencing happened like and to add i was heavily pregnant at that time so i was very pregnant with our first child um I remember the day that the sentence happened, I went back to my grandma's house, I didn't go home. My husband's been taken. So thankfully the judge gave me a suspended sentence so I didn't have to go to prison. My husband was sent to prison. Went off. I went to my grandma's house, my pastor came to the house and I remember saying to him, like, I don't get it. Like this, this Christianity thing, is, it's fake. It must be fake because I've done all the things. I've ticked all the boxes. I have, grown up in church I given I've been active I've served I got married I young like I'm doing all the things that we're told that we're meant to do and this happens like what is going on and um I just remember he didn't have like an answer he was kind of like yeah like like I hear you I hear exactly what you're saying like we pray together I don't even remember what he said but we prayed together. My grandma was there as well. And even my grandma was saying to him, you know, pastor, like explain this to us. Like, why did this happen? And he was like, I can't explain that like, why this happened. And um, yeah, so that happened. And I kind of just withdrew from everything. Then like a lot of, so before that I was a freelance photographer and I was doing all these projects and I was out there in the world, like doing stuff. And then this happened and I just withdrew from like the shame the paranoia as well because so when everything happened like people were sending me screenshots of like newspaper articles with like our faces and like mug shots and all this kind of thing and it was like um there was just a lot of shame basically and I withdrew and I lost a lot of opportunities as well like I was kind of like writing for places and I was meant to be like doing things with like certain christian outlets and whatever else and when this all happened it all like went away which you can say fair enough right it all kind of went away i was meant to be working on a project with like a a broadcaster that went away so i just yeah i just withdrew and i think i became quite um bitter like very kind of bitter i will say my church community really stepped up like they were so supportive they played a big role in why I still kind of consider myself a Christian now because they were so supportive they surrounded me they prayed for us they were like whatever you need were there but outside of that like the other kind of Christians and even people who would like come to our wedding and dance and all this kind of thing it was like there was just a lot of judgment and a lot of like no one asked any questions it was like oh you need to repent and I would always say to them repent of what like tell me what I need to repent from oh well you know you've been convicted and da, da, da. and I said yeah and I didn't do it like I didn't do it I didn't know there was anything dodgy ha- like even if I didn't know that there was something dodgy happening like would I just be accepting like it didn't even make sense would I be accepting money into a bank account with my name like if I was trying to like launder money like surely I wouldn't just be going into the same bank account that I've had since I'm like 15 like so it just but people were very much like this bad thing has happened to you for a reason and the reason is you've done something wrong and for like a while I was just like apart from like church family and like other a few other Christian people in my life I was just like I'm done with yeah. this whole thing it's just yeah. absolutely fake yeah, yeah. It, it, it strikes me that um sometimes people people ask you know what's the what's the point in theology 
But actually, even in you sharing your story, you think, well, theology really matters. Because if we get our theology wrong, it can have some pretty devastating real world consequences, such as if, if you believe, well, I do my bit, God, and then you promise me an easy life. Like, that, can, yeah. that could lead to disappointment, can't it, if, if we get that wrong? I do disappointment, yeah. And, and what you say as well about, the, about the, the church community, on the one hand, your local church being great. And on the other hand, I know you said in your TED talk, um, you're working with a, a Christian business and when the court case happened suddenly they didn't want to know about it and all the work dried up and it just strikes me that, that Christians clearly behaved in very very different ways and, and probably had very different answers um in, in quote marks answers to <laughs> to your situation um yeah. it sounds like you experienced a real breadth of of positive and not very positive at all reaction from Christians when you were going through a huge amount as you say not just a court case but being heavily pregnant as well there's a huge amount to deal with yeah and it was just so striking just like there was one there was like one kind of Christian personality who had um posted the article of the court case on her Facebook page for people to discuss and it was like it was like what an uh, like is that what we're doing <laughs> like is that is that what we're doing like as Christian like she posted for like people to like weigh in and to discuss the details and then on the other hand I had like yeah like friends from church who were like praying and constantly kind of like coming like is there anything we can do I didn't need to buy anything for the baby like up until that point I hadn't really bought anything anyway because like during the court case our finances had been restricted and all that kind of stuff but they they gave gave me clothes gave me pamp like everything I didn't need to buy anything they like proper just held me so you had this like mad spectrum of like responses from people who were calling themselves Christian and I honestly say that the way that my local church reacted I think is the grace of God because if it wasn't for them I don't know if I would still like be in the church that is the honest truth yeah and presumably around this time you must be having some very um upfront conversations with your husband because as you tell the story you're about to get married um you know, I, I can remember from when I got married, you know, transferring money between bank accounts, very normal thing to do, paying for <laughs> wedding expenses, getting the honeymoon yeah. sorted. So it, as far as you were concerned, this was just normal money be, being exchanged. Yeah. And then next thing you know, when the police get involved and there's talk of money laundering and fraud, presumably you go back to your husband and saying, hey, what's going on here? Yeah. What were those conversations like? <laughs> so I, I literally was like, what is happening? And he told me you know like no it's a mistake it's a misunderstanding da, 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 da. so I just went with it I was like okay fine again I'm waiting for that mad testimony like my equivalent of like God sending fire down from heaven so like but I'm waiting for that kind of like story and um yeah and obviously everything happened and I guess to be honest we didn't speak about it for a while because it was kind of like trying to work out what do we do now but then over the years, like as time has gone on and we've kind of spoken and he's admitted that, yeah, like I was I was doing some dodgy stuff and you shouldn't have been involved. Like I shouldn't have got you involved in that kind of thing. And um, that's been like a journey for us. And it's been a journey for him because I'll even say that now, like he no longer identifies as a Christian. Like he's kind of left the faith in that respect. And I think that's from his experiences in like he's gone through his own like I can't even imagine what prison's like he's gone through his own thing with prison he was there for four years and he came out of that like you know what I'm kind of like done Christianity like I don't like believe it anymore so we've kind of been on this journey as a married couple where we both started in this very like similar place this crazy thing happened that split us apart physically but we were very much kind of like there emotionally but then as time has gone on obviously just challenges like different viewpoints and um it's been it's been a it's another learning curve for me I would say because again you believe we I did the right thing I got married when I was meant to get married I did all these things and I one thing I will say is I never thought I really had like that kind of like quote unquote prosperity mindset like I always kind of thought yeah like I don't believe you know so five pound and you'll get 20 pound back but now realizing that I did have that mindset just not with money but with like my work so I thought because I did all these things God owed me based on my faithfulness but um 
so that's like a side point but yeah like the conversations have been quite hard over the years we've been through marriage counseling like twice um we're still working through that as a couple because prison just is like an un- even when the person leaves prison like it's an ongoing trauma that like you're kind of like dealing with um we've got two we've got two kind of sons together and my husband has a daughter um who's older as well so there's three children all and that's like another dynamic like when he went to prison we like there was his daughter but she didn't live with us so we didn't have any children under our house and then now he's back and there's two children and all this kind of stuff so it's been a journey I think and another kind of like journey of faith in the sense of trying to make sense of okay like what what do I think marriage means like when it isn't the the fairy tale wedding and you know everyone in the church clapping for you because you did the right thing and all the Instagram love because your couple goes like what does kind of that look like and it's an I can't give you an answer because it's an ongoing like we're still in it it's an ongoing thing holier than thou radical delusional ignorant perfect it's time to challenge stereotypes about Christians and Premier Christianity is leading the way transform your perceptions broaden your horizons open your mind to wide ranging views Read interviews with politicians, theologians, and TV presenters. Discover the breadth of the Christian spectrum. Be provoked, react, inspired, and informed. Get the print magazine and full online access for just £4.95 a month. Subscribe today at premierchristianity.com. Premier Christianity magazine. The bigger picture. I often get to talk to people who've been through some really, really challenging life circumstances. And of course, most of the time, by nature of what I do, they're, they're still identifying as a Christian. Their, their faith may look very different, but, mm. but you do just think, wow, it, it is a, it's, it's a work of God in people's lives, as you say, because mm. it's like, like you say, it could so easily have gone in a different direction. And, and in a sense, no one would blame you. You know, you think to, to go through all that upheaval, <laughs> you know, no yeah. one would blame you. think, wow, you know, she's been through a lot and she's working things out. But, but as you say, you are still a Christian. You still have faith. Your faith might look different or might, might have changed, yeah. but... I mean, you, you've already spoken about how the, the church community was vital in that in supporting you when you, you know, your mm. husband was in prison, you're raising kids alone and rallying around you practically. Have there been other things on the on the journey in, in recent years that you think that's really kept me going? That's kept my faith alive. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So after kind of everything happened and I remember I was still going to church because that was where my community was. But I wasn't there was like just a coldness, I think to everything I'm going to church because of the people and because I feel the love the support but there was a coldness towards God because I was very much like why did this happen and um yeah I so I was I didn't I don't even know what you would call that I guess kind of like almost like a not practicing Christian because I wasn't like doing all the things I was just I was in church in body but I wasn't like there in like mind or spirit really and I actually remember um it was when it was when Stormzy's album came out called Gang Signs and Prayer and there's that song on it um Blinded Blinded by Your Grace and I remember listening to the album through and getting to that song and just breaking down into like floods of like yeah even just thinking about it it makes me like well look I was like like lord I've been broken because I'm not worthy like you think I was just crying in my bedroom and I think that was the moment when I was I don't know something kind of like clicked in a sense of where you can say why you why you why you but almost why not you like what about you makes you so special that you don't need to go through certain trials and yes your trials look different to everyone else's and your story is not the same as anyone else but it's like we're all going through something so why do you deserve to have the easy life in that sense and that was a big turning point for me because I think now emotionally I was getting back to God and I was kind of like I'd been through that like anger and that kind of just hardness of heart and now I was kind of like okay like 
I don't know. I still don't know, have that answer to why, but it's again. It's like it's like you can't even really describe it. And it's we were actually at a friend's house over the weekend, and um, because my husband's not a Christian, and we were all Christians, so as this happens, you get into like these political, religious kind of like debates, and we were talking about miracles and like the nature of miracles, and like you know, has anyone seen like a miracle happen like in the Bible, like where a dead man walks or whatever and I was just thinking like the fact that I am here is a miracle like the fact that I'm here is actually a miracle like I've like I've struggled with depression um when I was younger I struggled with like suicidal ideation I've been th- through all these things and the fact that I'm here is a miracle and if you can and if someone was to say why are you here it's like I can't explain it like and it like going back to that moment, like listen to Blinded by Your Grace, I can't explain what happened, but something just broke open and I was like, wow. I guess it was almost like seeing, yes, this happened, but seeing all the ways that God was present, kind of like walking. So whether it was through the church or even going back to kind of like being in the courtroom and the fact that the police wanted the judge to give my husband 10 years and the judge gave him kind of like the least that he could possibly give which was seven years and the judge I remember the judge saying to me you know like um kind of essentially saying like you're gonna have your baby you're not gonna have your baby in prison you're gonna go home and I and I believe that this is just essentially a mistake that you're gonna move past and looking back on that now and see like I see that as the grace of God because someone else could have said no that's it you messed up like I don't want to hear excuses I just see you convicted criminal go to jail kind of thing so like looking back in my life and seeing these moments where it was like I think that was God hey this is Sam really hope you're enjoying this conversation right here on the profile podcast today could you do me a favor right now it'll take you just two seconds to give us a rating and a review wherever you found this podcast just a couple of seconds to give us a rating is so so helpful it helps other people to discover the show as well so if you could do that we would so appreciate it I was introduced to a woman who basically was experiencing the exact same thing and she was essentially two years ahead of me in the process so her husband had been sentenced two years before she had like young children and a friend introduced us and we just started speaking like I remember the first conversation I think we were on the phone for like two hours like a woman that I've never met before in my life and we were kind of just like talking and talking and um that was looking and then I can look back now and say oh that was the grace of God in that situation like that was God looking out for me when I wasn't even thinking anything about him like I was still angry I was still like why did you do this why did you allow this to happen what why 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 is all of my faith for nothing (laughs) essentially but he was yeah God was there looking out for me and yeah. yeah I'm really grateful to you for, for opening up a, a, about all of this that, that's, that's happened in your life. How does it affect you now in terms of, you know, is, is it a subject you want to talk about it? Is it a subject you kind of yeah. want to just forget about? Does it come up in day-to-day life, both personally mm. and professionally, and, and kind of how have you dealt with that? Um, so it kind of hasn't, it doesn't, it's not something that comes up day-to-day, like kind of like professionally. And I guess I have kind of spoken about it. I did the TED talk. I've like written about like kind of certain aspects. But I think this is the first time that I'm actually telling the whole kind of like story. And I guess it's something that I've not wanted to talk about before because I just, it, it just felt too painful. It just, I still guess felt maybe a certain weight of shame about it and just like not having maybe a a space to kind of say everything it's like I just don't want to talk about it all and then also part of it was like it's not 100% my story like it's very much my husband's story as well and I don't necessarily want to talk about that and then there's also just the practicalities like I've served my time like I don't need to declare I don't need to speak about I don't need to declare it like what's there's that um yeah there's that law that you know I can't remember when your conviction's spent like you don't need to declare it for certain crimes so 
that I don't need to talk about and for a long time I was like yeah that's in the past like I I don't want to I don't want to bring it up but I think more so now more recently like that is my story that is why that has led me to where I am now I don't think I would be doing the work that I do with Black Ballad or I would have written even a novel without that point in my life where I just stopped withdrew and kind of was a hermit for however long like a year 18 months because again even in those kind of like dark moments like looking back I can see how God was kind of like shaping paths and opportunities that have led to now so I think now I'm kind of in the respect that it's it's the, it's my it's my story yeah. so I can't I can't deny it and if it helps someone else just to know that you know you can go through some absolute madness and God can still use you God can still use it the madness that doesn't have to be the thing that defines you and for a long time I felt like if I talk about it, it's going to be the thing that defines me everyone's going to think about me as the person that went through this or the person whose husband's in prison or or whatever whatever and now I guess I'm just at a space where I'm like my life by the grace of God is so full with so many other things this can't define me I can't allow imagined shame to hold me back because you know Romans says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ like do I believe in Christ Jesus do I believe that or do I not believe that it just comes down to that yeah that's great so help us join the dots then between some of your story and the novel uh the novel as I said hope and glory even before it came out there was a lot of people talking about this book (laughs) um I remember uh as I often do flicking through the Sunday Times style magazine and uh and there you were uh, 10 places to know in 2022 so even before the book came out yeah. it was attracting attention uh, which you must have been delighted with but just help us understand how yeah. how the novel kind of relates relates to some of what we've already spoken about yeah so I think um so the novel actually came about because an editor approached me and was like have you ever thought about writing a book and I was like yeah like don't we all imagine like writing a book so I started working on this story and I think when I started working on the story I was in a place of still I don't know what's going on with life I don't really have a career I don't I just have this feeling of I guess shame that my parents have sacrificed so much and look at where my life is you know I'm for all intents and purposes I'm a single mom whose partner's in prison who's not really doing anything of note so I started writing this story about Glory who is in that position in a sense where she has left the UK to like go and make her name in LA and it's not going the way that she wants like she's kind of feeling like what is happening and then a massive tragedy happens her dad dies and she comes back to London and she finds her family in disarray her brother is in prison which obviously was inspired by my experience of having a husband in prison her sister is like kind of perfect on the outside but Dory has her suspicions about her marriage and her mum's on the verge of kind of like a mental health breakdown which I guess was almost like my projections of fear and shame and all these kind of things I think was kind of living in this family who all these tragedies have happened to them and they're in this very close-knit community and again everyone's kind of looking at them like why you (laughs) like why are you the ones that have tragedy after tragedy after tragedy like what is happening so that was the starting point and I think um I wrote it over the course of three years because, you know, children, (laughs) Um, (laughs) it's a lot. But as I was writing, I think I went on this journey of just unpacking, I think, a lot of shame and um, unpacking kind of like family and what that means and what almost like redemption. I think it's also a story about redemption as well, but redemption that people can have for each other, like people who have wronged each other, particularly family members or people who are fractured because of various um, things. So there's like a big family secret in the novel, which is kind of a point of contention between Glory and everyone else. And almost like you as a family can go through all these things and you can still find redemption, not perfect, like, 
all of a sudden your brother isn't out of prison I'm back home and you know yeah and dad's back and it's not that but there is a way to work through these hard experiences and I think that that came a lot from me and what I was going through and kind of channeling that hope and also the love that I have found being surrounded with by church by family by the friends who kind of like stuck by kind of channeling it all into that novel. I understand that, that writing actually has, has been a huge sort of interest of yours from a very, very early age, actually. Was it seven years old you were sort of starting to write a novel? Um, a I point? tried. <laughs> <laughs> I tried desperately to write a novel. So I've been a big reader from a very young age. And of course, like, um, my favourite book as a child was The Secret Garden. Like, I absolutely loved that book. But it wasn't about a little girl like me. So I wanted to write a story about a little girl like me. So I called it The African Princess and I tried and I think maybe I got a couple of chapters in and I was like, oh, this is too hard. Uh, so I kind of shelved it. And it's it sounds ridiculous, but I literally had it in my mind. Well, writing books just isn't for me. <laughs> like at this very young age, I can't do it. Like I'll write poems or like short stories or whatever instead. So um, yeah, writing has always been, I've kept a journal since I've, was about 13 which I found the other day when my dad was like clearing out the house and brought me this massive box full of journals and I was reading back and I was like oh my gosh (laughs) (laughs) all the angst and the oh it's 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 heartwarming but it's a bit cringe as well but um yeah so writing has always been the way that I process things and yeah but it's something you're you're obviously very good at I mean even just just reading your work online and some of your blog posts which you know are just you know superb superbly well written you. do you, you do you know that you're onto a winner while you're writing it do you feel like I'm in I'm in the flow now whether it's a blog or your or um or Black Ballad or the book um, is there a moment where you're like yeah I'm, I'm on it I think there is but I will say that the first draft always feels like the worst thing that I have ever written in my life <laughs> no matter what it is the first draft of anything even if it's like a short blog post I'm always like what on like this is absolutely terrible can I even do this anymore and then you leave it you come back to it and you're editing it and you can kind of see oh okay like I feel like I know when I'm onto something when I feel like if I could just speak and it would sound like this I would be happy so if I feel like it's like me talking just better then I'm like okay yeah this this works but you you have to go through the what on earth is this rubbish (laughs) (laughs) It's so true. What you have to go back and, and edit yourself. I mean, I, I do this and I, I say this all the time that every writer needs a good editor and yes. including editors. So I'm an editor, but yeah. I need an editor. You know, everything I write goes through other people. And there's something yeah. about that. That first draft, I, I can relate to that sometimes. I'm not feeling it's very good. But once you go back, I often think with writing, it's just a question of how much time you have. If you had yeah. all the time in the world, you could carry on going back, going back, make it better and better and better. Yeah. In journalism, we don't have that, as you know, we don't have that much time. Yeah. Is, there, is there a bit more time in the book writing process, though, to kind of really shape things? Yeah, there definitely is more time. But at some point, you just need to be like, this is it. Yeah. I did an event and someone asked like me about hope and glory and like, oh, is there anything that I would change? And I was like... I can think of a million things that would have made the book even better. But I know that when that when I finished that book, that was the best that I gave at that point. And I just have to make peace with that because yes. otherwise you'll never get anything done or put anything out there because you're constantly like just trying to be, and nothing's perfect. Like perfection doesn't exist. So all you can do is just do your best. And if you can stand by it that like my measurement is can I stand by this and say I did the absolute best that I could yes I can see where it could have been done better but that was the best that I had at the time then we go yeah. with that and presumably this is only the first of many yeah so I've just well I'm working through this I'm editing the second book that I've written and I've got I've got a bunch of book ideas in me so I'm hoping to continue writing for a long time you've spoken a lot about your your christian upbringing and how your faith has changed over time uh, but obviously you know you're, you're working with with the book and and i guess with black ballad as well you're working in in kind of mainstream uh sometimes non-christian environments but but you're someone who's very upfront and open about who you are as a christian how has that been has that been straightforward to to live as a christian in a in a mainstream world or has that brought challenges 
honestly I would say it's been quite straightforward the challenges that have come have been from other Christians who maybe think that I shouldn't be doing this or I shouldn't be doing it like that or you working in this capacity is compromising your faith that has been the biggest challenge um but other than that like most like yeah other people are very much like thank me I work in a in a realm where um faith isn't a taboo I work mainly with black women around black women so even if it's not a black woman of faith whether that's a Muslim or a Christian or some other kind of religion there's still that kind of background of we know like like we've grown up around it we we know the kind of score so I've never felt a way about my faith in that kind of aspect um I feel like it's just been space for a lot of great conversations like meeting different people from different backgrounds and different kind of like perceptions and just being open to those like potentially challenging conversations and kind of I've enjoyed that and I think people are very gracious and my experience is that people have been very gracious and kind of very much kind of accepting of who I am as and I'm accepting of who they are as well and I've learned a lot of grace myself just being in these like quote unquote non-Christian environments and being around people of different beliefs and I think I'm better for it but yeah I know that there's been conversations I've had with other Christians who are kind of like well you know shouldn't you always be writing about God or shouldn't you only be writing oh is hope and glory a Christian novel and it's like first of all what does that mean a Christian novel and second of all it probably isn't whatever you think it's gonna be (laughs) (laughs) I'll just like let's get everyone's expectations of like there's not an altar call at the back of the book no (laughs) and even to a certain degree so I might say that the depiction of um, Christianity in hope and glory some people might not necessarily like it because um, it's glory's mother as she's kind of like struggling through um, her issues like she turns to faith in a way that I think a lot of us have seen especially in like older kind of African generations where it is that very like quid pro quo like you pay a holy person 200 pounds and they will bless you and give you that fire. So some people might even take like umbrage with that, but that is the, that's the story that I felt like I had to tell. And it's based in, it's based in reality, isn't it? That's the thing. It it may be a novel, but it's, it's based on the reality that there are Christians out there or there are churches out there that that do things in that way. And all you're doing is you're fairly inaccurately representing something that's true. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I, I'd hope so. I wonder if there's a, I can relate to this, I wonder if there's a category error sometimes, isn't there, with Christians? We, we have this as a magazine where it's basically, but but why aren't you preaching the, the area of theology and doctrine I personally agree with? Because well, a Christian magazine doesn't exist just to feed back to you all of what you already believe. It exists to broaden your horizons. And in the same way, now why isn't there an altar call at the back of a novel? Because well, a novel <laughs> isn't supposed to do that. That's not what a novel does. Um, yeah. So I can relate yeah. to that. I think there's a bit of an education needs to happen sometimes in, in the church in terms of when people are called to particular careers or areas of work that, yeah, you're called to be a Christian in that world, but you're not necessarily called to be a, a street preacher evangelist in the way that some yeah. people think you are. Yeah. And I mean, I was like, I'm not anyone's pastor or preacher or teacher. Like that is not where, like, if you want that there are very clear avenues to go (laughs) to you know get your theological educate like I'm a big fan of theology um I listen to kind of a lot of theological podcast I find that all fascinating but that is not my calling I am not I'm not an apologist I'm not a theologian I'm just a Christian who I've been blessed with this talent and this is how I feel led to use it and ultimately I can only do that prayerfully and faithfully well I don't know if you intended it as a sales pitch or not but it worked for me when you said that whatever you whatever you think the novel is it isn't I think that's a fantastic (laughs) sales pitch so if you want to check it out it's called Hope and Glory by Jandela Benson and it's out now wherever books are sold Jandela thank you so much for coming on the show it's been a real pleasure thank you thank you I've really enjoyed it well thank you so much for joining me right here on the profile on Premier Christian Radio. It's been wonderful to have your company with us this afternoon. I hope that story from Jandela 
has provoked some thought in you, maybe even inspired you. As Jendela said in the interview, she's sharing this story because she hopes it speaks to someone about God's goodness and God's presence, even in the darkest of moments. Her debut novel, Hope and Glory, is out now and available wherever books are sold. And you can also read that conversation in the latest issue of Premier Christianity magazine. The July issue is out right now. Our cover story is about how to find peace in the age of anxiety. We're also looking at the important topic of how to raise the next generation. We've got a fantastic article from Loretta Andrews on raising anti-racist kids. And R.T. Kendall has been sharing with us in his article, The Road Less Travelled, How to Live for the Approval of God Alone and Not Worry What People Think of You. So there's lots of fantastic, positive and encouraging content in the latest issue of Premier Christianity magazine. And we've got a really special summer offer running for a limited period of time while the weather is so glorious. Why not check it out now? Three print issues of the UK's leading Christian magazine, full access to our website, and the digital edition as well, all for just £5 for not one, not two, but three issues of the magazine. That's right, you can get three print issues of the magazine delivered to your door for just £5. The full details are available right now at premierchristianity.com forward slash subscribe. I do hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. We'll be back same time, same place next week with another fantastic story for you. See you then. You've been listening to The Profile in association with Premier Christianity magazine.